I'm Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ, and these are the PM services for Sunday, July, or should say June the 6th. We'll sing several songs, and I will deliver a message that hopefully will be uh, edifying and enlightening to all of us. And so we're singing from Songs of Faith and Praise, if you would open your books to number 31. Number 31. <clears throat> Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and Five twenty three. <coughs> Excuse me. Five twenty three. I know the Lord will find a way for. Observe the Lord's Supper, number 18. Same. For I 
I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. Faithful love is a friend, just when hope seems to end. Welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace. Faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirits far burning bright. In the night, guiding my way, faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love, and I'll never be the same. Faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. For I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. We're instructed on the first day of the week to break bread together. Uh, this was instituted by Jesus as he, uh, the night he was betrayed, gathered together uh, to observe the Passover with his disciples. He explained to them that he would die. He explained to them that uh, he would give up his body, that he would give up his blood. So emblematic of that, Jesus took bread and he took the fruit of the vine and he told them, take this bread and take this cup because they would symbolize what Jesus was giving up for um, each of them at that particular time. But moreover, uh, for all believers, all who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, all who believe that uh, Jesus died for our sins, that uh, we... Uh, uh, gather about this table uh, so that we can uh, remember because it is so very, very important to us. And so as we do gather, let's think of the emblems that uh, we are partaking and their significance. Let's pray for the bread. We're grateful to Heavenly Father that your son was willing to give up his body to make that perfect sacrifice for each one of us that he was willing to suffer, that he was willing to uh, uh, separate himself from you for a period of time. We just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would take this uh, uh, symbol, that we would take this bread uh, in such a way as to uh, remember and uh, revere the significance of the sacrifice we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And in like manner, Jesus took the cup and explained that the uh, fruit of the vine would... Uh, remind us that Jesus was to shed his blood, which he actually did. And the significance of that blood is that it is the blood that washes away our sins. Without the body, without the blood, we cannot have entrance into heaven through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. We're grateful that Jesus was willing to shed that life-giving blood that uh, we might uh, just uh, understand uh, how significant that was and how significant the uh, lifeblood of Jesus is to us as it is that which washes away our sins. 
I pray that you would bless us as we partake. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And we've completed the Lord's Supper, but we are also commanded on the first day of the week to lay by and store that which we have been prospered. And so let's uh, just think as we have just uh, considered the sacrifice and the giving that Jesus did, the giving that God did for us, uh, that we have the opportunity to give back to the Lord. Uh, let's uh, pray for the offering. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, we have the opportunity to give. Uh, we are told that uh, God loves a cheerful giver, and we are told that uh, we are to give back uh, what is rightfully yours. We just pray that those that uh, utilize the funds that uh, we contribute will do so with uh, the mind that uh, we are to be the beacon of uh, your word here in this part of New Jersey. Bless our giving. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And the song before the lesson is number 957. Let's sing verses 1 and 3. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, oh Lord you know, you know, I have no friend like you. Friend like you if heaven's not my it's not my own, then, then Lord, Lord, what will, what I, will do? I do? The, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know, you know, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not mine, not my own, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Great job with the singing. Thank you so much for participating. If you were there this morning, uh, you heard uh, uh, the rather unusual title uh, that uh, is, It's Business, It's Not Business, It's Personal. I'd like to do the reverse of that for just a moment to get us into proper perspective. Most of you know that I'm kind of a movie buff. And uh, I have liked the Godfather movies, both Godfather 1 and Godfather 2. Um, in Godfather 1, um, when uh, the part played by Al Pacino, Michael, who uh, was not going to get involved in the family business, but finally did, uh, was designated to actually uh, do in uh, a couple of bad guys, as if he wasn't a bad guy already. Um, he had gotten punched, broke his jaw, and his brother Sonny uh, said, Michael, you're taking this too personally. And he looked around. He's taking this 
personally. And he said, it's, it's not personal, it's just business. And uh, Michael was quick to reiterate, this is business. This is what I'm supposed to do. Maybe in a, uh, a lighter way. Um, in professional sports, very often players get traded from one team to another or they get released and they sign with another team. It's, a, it's especially tough for fans who have grown accustomed to certain players and uh, they kind of miss them. And one of the things you always hear and you hear it from the players, you hear it from the owners, you hear it from the general managers. Uh, professional sports is a business. It's not personal. Well, I'm going to reverse that this evening and say, uh, in our relationship with God, it's not business. It is actually personal. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we have some, uh, a couple of verses that are foundational verses to our belief and to our assembling together. We, we kind of glom them together as almost one verse. And it says, uh, and let us consider how to stimulate one another uh, to love and good deeds. And it says, and here's the one that folks often use to say we're supposed to come to church every Lord's Day. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, those verses encapsulated within our, themselves are very, very important to us. But this is a sobering passage, verse 25, especially when we think of the passages that follow it. For example, if we look at verses 26 to 31, it says, For if we go on sinning willfully, and this is continuing the thought, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. All of these things have to do I believe, with our assembling together. Uh, it, it makes all of this sober when we contextualize it and we attach the, uh, I guess, the eternal ramifications of forsaking assembling together because that's the keynote here. Words like severer punishment vengeance, terrifying, in connection with sinning willfully, of which forsaking the assembly is a contextual example. It's almost as if they're saying, if you forsake the assembly, these are some of the things that may happen to you. Now, in a nutshell, it's because these times to God are personal, not a business. It's not business as usual. These verses are personal. The Bible is full of references of God's desire to be worshiped and to receive our worship. Why? Because God is worthy of our worship. He is the creator of all. And he has that right. 
But in this passage, it is personal in the sense that he commands, and what he commands is helpful to you and I. I think what God is saying here through the inspired writer who wrote the book of Hebrews is, how can we expect to lift one another up and do our part in God's kingdom here on earth if we don't gather together the way we're supposed to. So written on the foundation that Jesus is our high priest, and we find that in verse 29 of chapter 10, the writer urges us to do three things that I'm going to focus on this evening. In verse 22, he says to draw near. And then he says to hold fast, to hold fast. And as verses 24 and 25 begin, he says, let us consider. It is the considering part that I'd like to talk about and that I would like us to notice for just a little bit. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now that day is not Sunday. That day is the judgment. And so I want us to see what's personal about all of this. First of all, there should be a personal connection. Let's look at the verbiage here. It says, let us consider. Let who? Let us consider. Consider what? Consider what our duty is. All right? Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. So we have the us and the our. He says one another twice. And so God is obviously talking about the good that takes place when people assemble together with one another and the effect that they have on one another, the connection which we have with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I would propose that that's very personal. Assembling is about seeing that we are in a vital place and we are a vital piece of an important whole, the whole being the church, the kingdom of God on he in heaven. And we're a vital piece of that. Why? Because we're a member of the body. When we took the Lord on in baptism, we took that as a personal part of our life. And so uh, forsaking the assembling is for whatever reason, if you think about it, is selfish. It's self-centered. It's saying that we're blind to the needs of others because how can we encourage one another? How can we stimulate one another on toward love and good deeds? How can we have that personal connection with one another if we are not with one another? And so first, there should be a personal connection connection. Secondly, there should be a personal submission. The command consider is followed by two, in, in, in English grammar, uh, two participles that tell us how to obey the command. It says, not forsaking and encouraging. 
Now it says encouraging in verse 24, but if we look in verse 25, it says not forsaking our own assembling together is the habit of some. And again, he reiterates, but encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. This is a personal submission. And so in a a discussion uh, about the whole group, there is a command that each ought to strive to obey. As it is a command, ultimately, this is personal to God and to the individual. To submit to the Lord is a personal thing. It's not business as usual. It's not something done perfunctorily. It's something to do with feeling because we love the Lord and we love the, the fact that uh, God sent Jesus to us. And so as a command, this ultimately is as personal to God and the individual as it can be. If I fail to consider my role in all of this, I fail in my relationship with God. I have a role in this. And if I don't take part in that role, my relationship with God is thwarted. So we have a personal connection and we have a personal submission. Third, we have a personal obligation. When he says consider, that's, that's literally a command. Each of us is obligated to stimulate and encourage everyone else. Now, by the way, this isn't just those that lead the worship. It's not just the ones that get up and lead the Lord's Supper, or lead the prayers, or, or uh, lead the singing, or preach the, the message. It's all of us. We're all a part of that. And there's a personal obligation. The person sitting in the pew that doesn't preach or doesn't teach a class or doesn't lead singing is just as important as those people that do because we are a piece of the whole. This, these verses are not written to the elders. It's not written to the preacher. It's not written to the Bible class teachers. It's not written to the song leaders, although it is. It's written to every member of the Lord's church. All of you are to stimulate. All of you are to encourage. And so... The reclusive saint that dashes out as uh, soon as services are over misses out on something. The, the Christian who clams up and, and never talks to anybody misses something because he, he doesn't reach out to his brothers and sisters. And, and the, the, the discouraging brother uh, who... Uh, uh, or unloving brother who uh, literally rebels against their duty isn't focused on stimulating and encouraging one another. Instead, I should be so lost in my efforts to be a blessing to others that I really have no <laughs> energy left to evaluate how others are doing. It's all about how well am I doing? How well am I stimulating? How well am I encouraging? It's my job. Fourth, there should be, there should be personal anticipation. Now, this is more than social. It's more than emotional. It's spiritual and it's eternal. We should have the anticipation for the spiritual part of worship 
and the realization that all of us, all of this leads to our spending eternity with the Lord. Those other aspects are mean are a means to the end, but let's not miss out on the end. What is our goal? Just as the Apostle Paul said, I don't consider myself as having laid hold of it yet, or I don't consider that I have grasped it yet. Uh, the Apostle Paul was reaching out every day and doing everything he could to make himself viable in the sight of God and doing uh, God's will. And that's the way we are to be. I haven't laid hold of it yet. I'm still striving toward the goal because these verses say what happens to those that... Uh, uh, go on sinning willfully. And part of the sinning willfully, I believe, is connected with not stimulating and encouraging one another. And that's attached to assembling together with one another. Be a blessing to one another at church services. That's what we are supposed to be. And it says... As you see the day drawing near, and please remember, the day drawing near is not next Sunday. The day drawing near is judgment, the judgment day. And I need to remember that we don't have a lasting city. As wonderful as the church is, the church will dissolve one day. The kingdom here on earth will morph into the kingdom of heaven. And we are seeking the city to come. Uh, that's what it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 13 and verse 14. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city to come. But in order to get to the city to come, we need to do what is necessary in the city that we are in right now, that being the kingdom of the Lord here on earth. One of the best places to stay reminded of all of this is in the assembly because that's what the assembly is focused on. We sing and we praise God. We, we pray to the Lord. We gather about the Lord's table. We give back to the Lord. We study a part of the Lord's word. Hopefully, if we have a good preacher, he's trying to stimulate us. He's trying to encourage us. We, we have scriptures to look up. We can be Bereans. We can be like those that just, just weren't... Uh, prima facie accepting, uh, you know, the preacher said it, that settles it, it must be right. Preachers are not infallible. We, we just try to get the word across and we study and we try to put uh, scripture-laden uh, messages together. But all of that being said, we're reminded that the best places to get this done is in the fellowshipping together with other Christians so that our teaching and our preaching anchors us to the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is the last song that we sang. And I sang it for a reason, just to fit in right here. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Okay? Yeah, heavens is my home. And so we need to, to view that song in light of what it says. We're just passing through. As important as this church is and the assembling together is that we do this right. We're doing this right so we transition, come judgment, to the next world. So when we get to the world, that is our permanent home. 
when we talk about business, we, it's almost as, as if we have part A, part B, part C, part D, and so forth. And I'm not saying for, for those of us who like to compartmentalize, and that's okay. But Christianity is not about the business of going through the motions. Observing the Lord's Supper is not going through the motions. Singing to the Lord in praise is not going through the motions. It's not. It's personal. I sing to the Lord. I observe the Lord's Supper as between me and God and what Jesus did for me. It's personal. And that truth has to permeate us and has to permeate our attitudes, uh, not just toward God, but toward his children. You know, it's easy to say, oh, I love God. God loves me, but we're all his children. All who have taken on the Lord and assembled together are his children. They're our brothers and sisters in the Lord. They're the ones that we're to stimulate and encourage to love and to good deeds. And we do that through our assembling together. This is the attitude that we are to take. And so I hope the message rings true with all of us, that this idea of going to church isn't something, you know, we set the alarm on Sunday morning and we say, I got to go to church. That's not it. If we have to set the alarm, we say, I have the opportunity to go someplace where I can encourage and stimulate one another where I in turn can be stimulated and encouraged toward love and toward good deeds. And this only happens when I am gathered together with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's not a business. It's very, very personal. My entrance into heaven is personal. It is between me and God not business. It's personal. It's between me and my God. And so as we finish this evening, if you are not part of the Lord's church, if you're not part of God through Jesus Christ, because you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your uh, Savior, I just I just pray that you will do that. I pray that you will uh, accept Jesus uh, uh, as your Savior. You confess him as the Son of God and that he becomes a part of your life. If you haven't confessed Jesus, repented of your former ways, and been baptized for the remission of your sins, we offer you this invitation this evening. Call one of us. We are there. We will be there uh, with you uh, on, a, on a moment's notice to assist you in coming to the Lord through baptism. Let's all pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we had this time together to uh, sing praises to your name, that we had this time together to uh, uh, listen to a part of your word and to uh, maybe uh, have food for thought uh, as we put our heads on our pillows, that we will uh, maybe take a closer look at uh, the 10th chapter of Hebrews and and what goes along with verse 24 and 25 all the way through to verse 31 and, uh, and see what it means and hopefully understand that all of this is about a personal relationship with our Lord and our God. And with that, that means a personal relationship with his children. Help us to always be desirous 
of stimulating and encouraging one another to love and good deeds. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we try to do your will in all things. Help us to comfort one another as you comfort us and continue to uh, uh, have your word be the uh, lamp unto our path and the light to our word. Bless us. I pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Have a pleasant evening. Be safe and may God bless you all.